Two terms on the Burlington City Council. He has moved to the Vermont Senate. There he was from 2013 to 2016, the chair of the Finance Committee in the Senate, and he is the current president pro temp for the Senate. Please welcome Tim Ash. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, I won't take it personally if you keep eating, and uh, I'm gonna call on people at random to ask me questions when I'm done, and I want you to uh, do so without regard to lettuce in your teeth or anything else. Um, before I get started, I'm gonna uh, kind of take two different tacks to discuss issues of racial justice in our criminal uh, justice system, and then our prison population overall. Um, but just a quick uh, word about why I'm particularly interested in issues of criminal justice, uh, racial justice in the criminal justice system. Um, so I grew up in Massachusetts, in a, uh, outside of Framingham, Massachusetts, if anyone knows where that's located. And my father was a, I say at least one hand, thank you. Um, uh, my father was in the Massachusetts probation department for 43 years before he retired. Framingham was a community that, uh, when I was a kid, uh, was almost all Caucasian with a growing Puerto Rican population. And by the time I graduated from high school, the Puerto Rican population was still there, but it was the Brazilian population that had uh, sort of taken over uh, as the non-white population. And my dad, um, I can't say that he was a uh, deep reformer who thought about system changes. His general view was that most people who get caught up in the criminal justice system are good people who've made a mistake and that we have to do right to support them, to work them towards a more successful uh, participation in their community. And frequently he would come home at night and he would say something like, uh, hey, do you know Stephanie Seguino? Sorry to pick on you. Which was usually code for someone I knew had gotten into trouble. And what that insight meant to me, though, was it really was the beginning of me understanding that people who know people and people who know people like them who are in positions of influence have access to a different type of justice than those who do not. I would often get, uh, when my mother was going to night school uh, to get a master's degree, I was often parked at the courthouse with my dad and I would see the people coming through for all the sort of routine infractions and it was pretty obvious, even, you know, even someone in middle school or high school, that you saw the white people walking in, generally with people wearing suits accompanying them, and you saw a lot of people of color who were walking in trying to fend for themselves and navigate a criminal justice system, which is very difficult. Uh, so this has been something I've always been particularly interested in. Uh, I am gonna start my, my presentation here um, with what I call anatomy of a potential uh, unjust policy. And oftentimes, if you're in the State House in Montpelier, I think invariably, if you asked all 180 people, should we have a criminal justice system that is bias informed, that always tries to make sure we're eliminating systemic injustices and individual injustices, I think all 180 legislators would say, of course, we want to have true equality in our justice system. And we are making some strides to try to address the existing problems in our system. Sometimes though, without perhaps thinking deeply enough, we set ourselves on a path to do uh, damage rather than make things better. And so where I'm gonna, Start today, uh, for those of you in the back, you won't be able to read it, but many of you know Vermont has been considering legalizing marijuana for a legal retail market. The Senate, uh, which I preside over, has passed some version of this uh, policy each of the last few years, uh, and it seems like this now has uh, the momentum in the House of Representatives and possibly even with the governor to become law. But like many bills, what you hear as the sort of headline, which is you know, legal marijuana sales, there are 100 policy choices underneath that. I think people would not suspect that in a bill related to legalizing the safe uh, sale of marijuana in retail stores and having a system of growing it, most people would not suspect that in that bill there would be a provision to make it a primary offense 
to not be wearing a seatbelt when you're driving a car. Had anyone heard about that one yet? Was that like in the, I don't know, head, the cyber headlines or the headlines or on Twitter? I haven't really seen much about that. So what this is is a section of the current bill that's working its way through the House, section 181, so that tells you how many different pieces of this bill there are. And the language which is uh, stricken, uh, I'll read it for those in the back. This section may be enforced. This is uh, basically about pulling people over. Only if a law enforcement officer has detained the operator of a motor vehicle for another suspected traffic violation, which is to say you can only enforce the existing law requiring someone, the driver to wear a seatbelt if they pull you over for something else first. Now, by striking this language, it would allow law enforcement officials to pull people over primarily because they are not wearing a seatbelt. Now, before I challenge you all to tell me if you are standing on a road where cars are going 35 miles or above to pick out which people are or are not wearing a seatbelt, which I try from time to time, I'll just tell you, it's not very easy. This policy has the potential to exacerbate racial injustice in the state of Vermont. Why do I believe that to be true? Well, if law enforcement officers, like all people, have their inherent biases, even when they're trying to confront them and challenge them, we still make decisions based on those biases that are inside of us. And the question that should rightly be asked is will this be a tool that will result in more people of color being pulled over as a result of this new option? Not because law enforcement wakes up in the morning and says, I'm looking for a new opportunity to do it, but rather that our inherent biases would, might lead to that result. So the question is, why am I making such a big deal out of this one? And it's in part because my suspicion is two types of people will be disproportionately pulled over by, for this offense. The first one is younger people. Uh, I was one of those younger people with wild hair and a beard and, uh, you know, I didn't have like fish stickers on my car, so I wasn't a total target. Um, and people of color. And that's my, that's my bigger worry, to be perfectly, perfectly frank. So, I contacted um, last year when this bill, it was a standalone item before it got attached to this marijuana bill. I contacted uh, uh, Professor Frank Baumgartner at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. In North Carolina happens to be the state that was collecting uh, traffic data and the racial uh, component of traffic data uh, much more comprehensively than any other state. And sure enough, the primary problem with pullover, this is from a book that he and several other professors wrote called Suspect Citizens. Uh, the primary problem, if you pull over people of color more frequently as a result of uh, this primary seatbelt enforcement issue, it leads to, and I'm gonna learn how to use the pointer, it lead, this up here, it says searches, and this first group here is black males. So what you'll see is after the, the, the internal biases that people have will lead to increased a disproportionate pullover rate for people of color, then the next problem is that people of color, you can see the search rate far exceeds what we see uh, for the category right next to it, which is white males. It also turns out that for black females, which is this third set, it's slightly higher um, than it is for white females. In Vermont, and uh, Professor Seguino from the University of Vermont is here, so I, uh, I told her she'd see her name on this. Um, this, uh, and this is, the, the heading on this one is mine, not hers, uh, because this was, uh, she was kind enough to email this to me last year while I was thinking about this. This is effectively the frequency of vehicle searches after being pulled over in Vermont. The important thing here, uh, well, I guess there's two. A motor vehicle infraction, which is this uh, second, uh, column here, that's you have a defective taillight or something, they pull you over for that. Investigatory would be you drove over someone's lawn, you crushed a yard gnome, you did something else, and they uh, pulled you over. But what you can see here is that for in both instances, but in particular motor vehicle, which is likely where we would expect to see uh, seatbelt enforcement fall if it were to become law, that you basically have an almost four times uh, more like, you're four times more likely if you're, uh, if you have black skin to be, to have your car searched if you're pulled over for a so-called motor vehicle infraction. Now, 
I do want to be clear that our law enforcement is making great strides at both recognizing the problem, collecting data so that we can continue to root out the problem where it exists, and all of this is good news, and we have uh, much work to do. So this is not uh, to launch an attack or something on them. This is to acknowledge reality, this data, which I believe might be from about 2015. So it's a little bit dated, dated so it could be, we might have improved, I hope we've improved, uh, but it uh, at least tells some of the story. Um, in terms of traffic stops themselves, uh, admittedly, this is gonna be hard for you to read, so I'll tell you the punchline, basically, um, what, what we find is that as a share of the total population, black 1.6%, the total share of stops 2.9%. So these look, you know, sometimes numbers kind of mislead when we just hear those uh, smaller percentages, but it basically creates what, what uh, Professor Seguino has identified as a disparity index of about 161%, um, meaning that you're 161% more likely to be uh, uh, stopped per your proportion of the population. Uh, so if your percentage is over 100, it means you're more likely than your, uh, your proportion of the state's population. So I call this the anatomy of a problem because the, the intent of those who wanna put this provision in this marijuana law, it's not to pull over people of color, it is to save young people who don't wear seatbelts, right? The intent is spot on. But one of the things that we have increasingly challenged ourselves to do in the Senate and in the House, is when we are taking on a new proposal, which might seem far afield, is to say, how will this affect different segments of the public? What might we be missing about where this could lead? Are we comfortable taking a chance uh, with the uh, potential outcome that we will see? I will tell you, I for one am not uh, comfortable uh, taking this experiment. Uh, because we've seen in other states uh, what we get from it. I know that James from the ACLU of Vermont's here. Uh, the state of Florida's ACLU had done a report on this and they found exactly the same information that it is used disproportionately to pull over people of color. Once someone's in the system, we know that things don't always go swimmingly from there. So um, I start there. Uh, this is just one uh, additional thing you can, uh, I'll share it with the presenters of this if they wanna, uh, pass it out, I've literally cribbed from Professor Seguino and others. Um, basically, this is each law enforcement agency that had submitted information about uh, traffic stops with, with, a, with racial data included. If you're above that red line, it means that uh, black drivers are pulled over in greater percentage than their share of the Vermont population. If you're below it, it means you're getting pulled over less frequently. For what it's worth, um, for Hispanic drivers, it's rough, it's the same general takeaway. For Asian drivers, it's actually the opposite. Um, that's what the data suggests. So, now I'm gonna say just a quick word, and this is for the broader um, theme of criminal justice reform in Vermont. First of all, are, are people aware that Vermont has been undertaking an effort called Justice Reinvestment II? All right, so if you, how many, if the answer is no, raise your hand. All right, this makes me sad. And I'll tell you why it makes me sad, because about 13 years ago or so, or 14 years ago, and uh, the former state's attorney, Bobby Sand, may have been, a, I'm sure was a player in this, there was a first attempt to take a look at our criminal justice system with an eye to reforming it in ways that would allow people to be released from incarceration to become productive members of the community with the types of supports they need. And that um, effort was really powerful when it combined with some other things going on. I mean, crime in general has been down across the country, so there's been fewer, uh, a lot of states have fewer violent crimes occurring and so on. But as a result of that work and other uh, factors, what you'll see is when I arrived in the Vermont Senate in 2009, there were 2,233 total incarcerated people between the Vermont prisons and the people who were getting shipped out of state to private prisons. By the time 2016 came along, that number was 1,746. So almost a 500 person reduction in the number of people behind bars either in Vermont or under contract to a private prison. That is the result of people like you coming together 14 or 15 years ago to come up with strategies that would get people more successfully returned to the community. 
The sad truth, though, is we've been at, the, in 2016, we're at that 1746. It has basically been stubbornly at that number since. We have struggled to, despite other strategies and, and the amazingly challenging uh, effort of addressing our opiate uh, crisis and, and better understanding of how to address our mental health issues, we still have been stubbornly at that number. So last year, several of us um, reached out uh, to the organization that had worked with us the previous time and said, can you come back and provide us the expertise and technical skills and data crunching that would help inform a second attempt to deal with this uh, current uh, incarcerated population. Working together with the judicial branch and the governor's team for the last six months, a group of people have been coming together, looking at the data with an eye towards determining who it is that's behind bars, why they're there, and what might be done to release those who would not pose a safety risk and get back into the community. So they just released a report. I'll make sure uh, that it's available to all of you because some of the slides I'm going to show are very good. I'm going to skip that. Um, this information is somewhat dated, which I'm about to show you. Then I'll tell you when we're getting current. But one of the things I find important because Back home, I'll have constituents who will say to me, we need to like let all the nonviolent offenders out of jail, which on its surface seems like a reasonable thing to endeavor to do. But we also have to just face the reality of precisely who's in jail. If you're in for a nonviolent offense, what is it that led a judge to sentence you to be behind bars? Or what did you do that, that didn't allow you to stay in the community and you wound up back? So that 1,746 people at the time this was the rough breakout of what, it, what the nature of their crime, originating crime was that put them behind bars. And I use the term originating crime, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And what you'll see is about 53, 52%, more than half of that 1,746 number, the, the, the sentenced crime was a serious felony. And I'm going to tell you in a minute uh, what some of those serious felonies are. Um, and then it immediately drops off to uh, felony crimes against a person, property, or drugs, and then there's a, a, a smattering of, of, of other ones. What some of these things really mean when I say a serious felony, uh, aggravated assault, aggravated sexual assault, murder, and then there's a longer list, which I'll show in a second. Felony against a person would be assault and robbery, lewd and lascivious conduct, and there's uh, others. Um, this just helps give a little bit of a flavor of the types of things people may have done as their original crime that required them to be behind bars. That top number, which was 52% of all the people behind bars, have committed a serious felony, and I'm not sure how they would break out on this list, but it's the kind of really the worst sort of things, um, the worst kind of crimes, murder, um, aggravated assault, uh, which often has a sexual component. Um, I don't know if people get charged frequently for maiming, the state's attorney from Chittenden County may know, uh, manslaughter, and so on. So these are like the really bad ones. Um, uh, although, of course, sometimes the story is a little bit more uh, complex than it at first is. So why did we decide to embark on Justice Reinvestment II? Well, the first one is really because we want the community to have, we want to promote public safety, and we don't believe wrongly holding people longer than they need to be promotes public safety. It actually leads to worse outcomes. And we're also spending a lot of money to not address um, that promotion of public safety. What this uh, chart attempts to show is it says current design. So if the prisons that are in Vermont with the number of beds they were designed to have to house people or to hold incarcerated individuals, the actual designed capacity is 1,100. But the number of people actually in those facilities is 1,493, and this data is very current. It's within the last couple weeks or maybe a month, which means that we are packing people into some of these facilities, like sardines, and that means there isn't as much space to provide training programs, rehabilitation, mental health, counseling, and all the others. Anyone who has been to the women's correctional facility knows they do not, uh, <laughs> There is no space there. I mean, it is like it was designed for a very small number of people, like think 50 or something, and there's like 170 in there. So you can get the picture what that means when people say that the women don't have enough opportunities to, uh, 
start transitioning and getting ready to go back in the community. It's because of that overcrowding. Then, of course, we have this blue bar, which is even beyond the people we're stuffing in for facilities that weren't designed for them, we have to send people out of state. And that number, when I mentioned that our population of uh, inmates had dropped by about 450 or 500, that meant that we didn't have to send as many people out of state. That's a good thing. But it doesn't mean we were able to discontinue the use of out-of-state prisons, which is why right now probably 260 uh, Vermont, Vermonters uh, are somewhere in Mississippi. And it is somewhat shocking, and I received a message from one person in this room, who I shall go unnamed, asking if in fact the Vermonters are at the prisons in Mississippi where an inmate was just killed. Um, and we had to do some checking to make sure that they were not. And, but that's the kind of thing when you lose control of the programming is you don't ha <laughs> Corrections Corporation of America is many things. An exemplar of our community is not one of them. Um, so now this is where um, the racial make composition of our inmate population uh, ties into some of the themes you're hearing about uh, today. So the, the black percentage, uh, according to the uh, latest demographic research in Vermont, is 1.3%. It may be slightly higher. It, 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 that, the number may be complicated, but that's the number that is used for uh, demographic purposes. However, if you, the key uh, numbers to look at, in each case, this percentage above is the percentage of black inmates or black individuals in the community justice system for each of those um, statuses. So of the sentenced population, 7%, which is obviously much higher uh, than the proportion of the population in general. 12% of those who are detained but have not yet been sentenced. 5% of all uh, on parole, which is three times more than their percentage. Furlough, 5%. Probation, uh, 3%. So in some ways, even though this is meant to be a comprehensive criminal justice reform uh, program, every single decision we make has a racial justice element to it because of this disproportionate uh, representation here amongst people of color. This was perhaps the most uh, staggering first bit of information that this new justice reinvestment effort produced. The people uh, from the Council of State Governments Justice Center were the primary leads on this work with funding from the Bureau of Justice Assistance from the feds. And what this, uh, this kind of blob of colors tries to tell us is those who are incarcerated like that day, which was sometime last month, what is the precise reason they're in there at that moment? Not what was their original crime, but why are they in there that day? What you'll see is new court commitments, and I hesitate to say this in a room full of people who do this stuff professionally, but that's basically someone who's in there for the crime they committed for the original part of their sentence. All the rest of this, you'll see the word violations after whatever precedes it. Parole violations, there are 139 people behind bars right now. Probation violations, 541 behind bars right now. And furlough violations, 1,425. Which is not to say that those individuals hadn't committed a particularly bad crime. What it means is that at some point, the Department of Corrections allowed that person to be in the community and committed some kind of violation of their terms of release that resulted in them getting sent back behind bars. So, you know, one might Im immediately say, well, okay, well, like, did the person go out, you know, the worst case scenario, which leads some governors and people around the country not to do criminal justice reform because they're so worried that we're going to let people out, give them a second chance, and then they're going to do really bad things again. That's usually the political uh, dilemma. Well, this is a slide that my chief of staff, Peter, told me is far too busy for a public presentation. So I'm going to merely direct your attention to this little thing here, and for the people in the back, if you see this bigger blue curve, all the, the real takeaway here is the blue is way bigger than the orange there. The blue means that if you went back for a furlough violation, it was a technical violation. Now, that term we'll get to in a second. Only 22% of the people for a furlough violation committed a new crime. 
This is the important one because you'll see 1,425 people are back for a furlough violation. Almost 80% of them have committed a, what is called a technical violation. Now, not all technical violations seem so technical when you dig into it, but the point is they haven't committed necessarily a new crime. Only about 20% of the people have done that. So one of the most important things that we've taken away from this work and this new data is that we have to find strategies that when someone violates their conditions of release, the graduated sanctions are as frequently as possible in the community, not going back behind bars. The good news is it has very quickly taken hold that this is a problem that needs addressing. Um, we're working on a comprehensive piece of legislation which will touch on a lot of these themes. Uh, yesterday, and it's starting in our Senate Judiciary Committee, and the House Judiciary Committee is uh, sort of eagerly awaiting our work so that they can put on their, um, put their, their thoughts into it as well. But I asked the chair of the committee yesterday to pull out a section of the other bill, which is going to take the whole legislative session to work on, and fast track it by putting it into our, what we call the budget adjustment bill. Every year we pass a bill right at the beginning to make some corrections of the budget. It's the first big bill that passes each year. And we are going to take the uh, work group that is supposed to come up with sort of alternative graduated sanction strategies, and we are going to accelerate that piece of it by about five months so that by the end of the legislative session, we will already have the thinking about graduated sanctions in the community so we can see action on that sooner. Um, so I do encourage uh, you all to kind of stay on top of this. One other really critical thing that we have now learned about the women who are incarcerated, and we've all heard this sort of particularly egregious uh, news uh, and allegations at the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. Um, those are issues that need to be addressed. This issue is, or this data presents another aspect of thinking about the women who are incarcerated at present uh, in a different light. So the number of women incarcerated is the, is the big bar at the top, 106, and then each of the uh, apportioned colors underneath it is some uh, percentage of that total number of 106 women. So here we see a pretty similar um, set of numbers compared to the overall inmate population. So 33% are for the new crime. That's the people behind bars. They're, sent, they're actively behind bars serving out their original sentence. 35% and then 23 of them, which is about 20%, are there on a probation uh, violation. 36, which is in the, uh, about, about a third of all of them are there um, for a furlough revocation. So a lower percentage than the men, but still a very high percentage. So again, only a third are there for their original crime. Most of the people are there for something that happened after they were released back into the community. The other interesting piece is when, and I don't know where in the process this happens, it's over my head, but um, there is an assessment done to determine the risk factors of the individuals um, uh, when, they, when they get processed in. Um, and others can speak to the, 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 the success of those tools and the methodology. But what you see is the difference between women incarcerated who are viewed as low risk, which is this blue line here, and women who are considered medium or high risk. And the real takeaway here is that there are dozens of women who are behind bars right now who are considered low risk by the official tool that is used by the Department of Corrections. And right now, unless we make changes in our system, we're effectively saying that we are choosing to keep them incarcerated, despite there being low risk, versus trying other strategies that integrate the person back in the community and try to, try to get them back on their feet and successful again. That's an area where both the House and Senate are very eager to make progress this year. Uh, and any progress we have, and I hate to sound this like the crude, crude former affordable housing developer that I am, it will also reduce the number of people in that facility so we can actually do more appropriate programming in it. So it has a, a double benefit. It's a, it's a benefit for the individuals in getting their lives back in order, and it also makes the facility one that could be managed in a coherent uh, way moving forward. And that effectively is the end of my presentation because where I'm really going to leave it off is say for all of you who are particularly interested in these issues, this is actually an amazingly opportune moment 
to participate in real time with the work that's happening. The Senate Judiciary Committee literally every day is working on strategies to try to drive down the inmate population based on the data, some of which I've just shared with you. And there's gonna be plenty of things that are gonna be set in motion from there, looking at how we deal with the women in particular, how we deal with people of color in particular, uh, updates on the graduated sanctions, which I mentioned, and so on. And so for any of you who believe you have insights, I think some of you might, uh, into how we could best address these issues, this is the moment. And the other piece I should add is we are also being much more determined in our budget to include more resources for community supports and transition, whether it's housing, mental health, community justice centers, you know, and the like, uh, that help keep people uh, positively uh, outside of the prison. So. I am happy to take any questions that you have, but otherwise I want to thank you uh, very much. Uh, Doug Cavett, I spent uh, at least a decade uh, being diesel therapy around the state in every single facility and out of state, so I have a really good understanding on this. Um, there are no graduated sanctions anymore. They changed the language into interrupts and central case staffing, which is beyond the law. So now they can just give you two years, three years, anything they wish. The graduated sanctions were working, but because they were working, they created this new avenue. Well, yeah, and I, this is where I don't want to uh, over communicate my level of expertise. As a legislator, of course, we are charged with pretending to be expert about many things. Um, what we are is, Yes, no, that, I appreciate that. And um, I use the term graduated sanctions largely because the report that's been produced uses that, the reform of and use of graduated sanctions in the community. So I'm sort of parroting that piece. I think the important takeaway, and if I was speaking to a crowd that was not particularly focused on the issues of race and the law, I would be saying, I'll pe keep people in the community and face the music there rather than back behind bars and provide some support to make it successful. Um, but you're right, the, the technical language is important. Uh, right back there, thanks. Hi, Senator, I'm Kristen Chandler from Randolph. When you were talking about the, your concern about whether bills coming before the legislature may have some kind of bias that might affect some group that you may not think about, it made me wonder what bias training or anti-bias training do, do your uh, fellow colleagues receive in the in the Senate and in the House. It's a it's a, a good good question, um, and I am happy to report that the first year of each session now, both the House and Senate have what is effectively a required bias training uh, presented to us by outside experts, and this is the. Um, a shift in the culture, frankly, of the legislature. Uh, last year, many of you will know Bor Yang, who is now um, the, the executive director of the Human Rights Commission. Um, she did a two-hour uh, bias training with all 30 members of the Senate. Now, I don't want to uh, be insidery here, but let me just tell you, having 30 members of the Senate sit in a room for two hours and actually pay attention and be really actively participating, it may have been a first, okay? And that is important for two reasons. One, because we're doing it, and it, because we're being forced to confront these questions in ways maybe we haven't done before. Being forced to understand that it's not a weakness to say, is there something I'm missing here about my own attitudes or my own biases? Um, but to have the members of the Senate actually proactively participating. Like we didn't force people to say, you know, how are you feeling about all this? Every single member of the Senate over the course of two hours jumped in with a comment, jumped in energetically. We are now doing it a second time this year. Uh, so we will make, we're, I don't know that it'll be every year for the rest of time, uh, but basically two very uh, determined focused trainings of all members of the Senate. I believe the House is gonna do the second one as well. So um, that's a change. When I got to the Senate, there were no trainings on anything. I have a question. I, I'm, I'm Sheila Smith. I practice uh, family law in the area for over 20 years now. And I've, I find with this, um, it's, it's my perception that what has changed is that the, the, the 
designation of substance abuse disorder being a disability and then having um, all of the supports that comes with having a disability, I think in the cases that I'm seeing, which are really significant, like I mean earlier someone spoke of someone sitting in a car, I've had multiple cases in the last month of the substance abuse being at issue. And what I find is, is that people, parents will come to me and admit that if I had to, if I am sober, I will lose my housing benefit, I will lose my health insurance, I will lose my childcare subsidies, I will lose, I will be forced to go work, and I will lose, in particular, my housing and food stamps. Mm -hmm. So my, my concern is, is that what's happening is I'm having more and more kids cycling through cases where their parents have been, you know, the, the, this most recent one was like in the last 12 months that this child is only 12 years months old and in the 12 months the parents have never tested po uh, not positive the parents have not done half of what was asked of them to do mm -hmm. and the courts appoint me say to represent the kid and I'm saying find a nice looking lady in the supermarket before you hand these kids back to the cycle of constantly coming back for their furlough violations which seem innocuous but it isn't innocuous if you're that kid of the parent that cannot get their act together and the system seems to support the notion that that they want them to, we, we're, we're all good do, deed doers in wanting people to get sober, but in reality, on the street level, we've created disincentive to, to have that happen because all of those things will be lost and the people have to go out and and fend for themselves. Yeah. And there isn't enough, I think, in the next area where you are coming off of these support services to to um, to allow them to enter back in and gain full full uh, sustainability for yeah. themselves, right? Well, it's a couple, I mean, there's really the, I mean, as you know, with any of the lives that we're talking about, there could be many complicated things going on, uh, all colliding. Um, on the latter, the latter concept that comes to my mind is the broader issue of our, um, well, the health of our foster care system, which is struggling mightily and the need for more resources there. And the legislature, and I'm, I guess, as guilty as anyone, we hear about the uh, challenges and under-resourced foster care system and we put some money into the budget and we say, all right, we solved that one, which of course is not quite how it goes down. Um, we did contract with um, the, University, the University of Vermont College of Medicine and Social Work Program and Wendy Davis in particular, for those of you who don't know, used to be the Commissioner of Health, uh, to look to review a lot of the case files to come up with more coherent strategies that reflect the reality of the families uh, whose lives are being um, uh, facing these challenges. So I don't quite know what we'll hear back in terms of uh, action steps from that. On the issue of the challenges, uh, not inadvertently pretending that reality isn't what it is and sending kids, for instance, back into households where more damage might be done. You know, I can only say my first instinct to respond is to say that our, our system of treatment, which was anemic 10 years ago and is much better now, is still in need of a lot of work in terms of access, support, and so on, whether you're in or out of the criminal justice system. Um, and so to me, the important thing is that the resources are there uh, both to say if you've committed a community, if you're in the community but you're under uh, correction supervision uh, and you test positive and all those things, there should be a treatment option before you're going back behind bars. And I, don't, and I say that without knowing fully what, how we might treat that today, but to me if we can beef up those strategies and then of course on the way out and making sure that the person's going to succeed. Um, I, I sometimes, you know, we try to solve one problem and some new ones get created. And I'll give an example. I think Vermont ought to be commended. I don't say that because I was one of the sponsors of the bill, although I was. Um, our approach to medication assisted treatment in jail is one of the national leaders among states. 
but that hasn't come without some new wrinkles. Um, you know, you've got correction staff saying that it's being applied too liberally in terms of who's eligible for it. Some people, it might be counseling that needs to be combined with the medication-assisted treatment, and they're not getting the counseling, and so it might not even be the best practice. So we've, we have tried to, be, to do better on the way in, during, and on the way out. We have a long way to go, um, and that's, it's gonna be a journey. Okay, we've got time for one more question, if there is one. And of course, I'm always easy to access um, uh, down at the State House. So if you have any questions or you want to know how you could best be plugged into the work that I've described, I'm happy to kind of steer you in the right direction. All right. Well, well there's someone who hasn't asked one, so we're going to give the last question to a newcomer. Yeah, the, the resource allocation issue, I, um, I will make my only foray into what appears to be a political statement, but I'm, what I'm describing is, I think, just kind of a fact. Um, when it comes to mental health investments, which include support uh, for people who've been in uh, corrections uh, supervision, um, the legislature is in a bind. The administration has effectively put zero dollars in for increases each of the last three years except for some like micro programs that are new. Um, and that has put the whole system of mental health care under greater strain. So when the legislature says, well, that's not acceptable, which we've done each of the last three years and put more money into the system, it's coming at something else's expense because we also face vetoes if there's like another penny in the budget. So um, I think one of the most telling, maybe I'll leave it at this, one of the most telling comments came from the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Dick Sears, who was there back when we did this overhaul the last time. He said, when he was confronted with much of the new data and information, he said, I didn't realize that all of the savings hadn't been being reinvested by corrections into the community supports. And that was hard for him to say, because he takes a lot of pride in that work. And that's why we're very determined now that when we save under this justice reinvestment program, we actually reinvest the dollars into the kind of community-based programs uh, and activities that are so critical. And you know, history will judge whether what I've just said turns out to happen, um, but I'm determined that we're gonna do everything we can to make it. So thank you all so much, and I, I really wanna commend the people who put this conference on. It's really great. Thank you.